So this just comes in sequence with uh, the two talks that you've heard previously. We'll talk about late kidney allograft loss. Uh, nothing to describe when it comes to disclosures. Um, so this is the roadmap for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we'll look at definitions and a few categories as it relates to definitions and then talk about prognostics, some causes or etiologies of late allograft loss and then try to talk a little bit about mechanism as it relates with chronic antibody mediated rejection. But first, a question. So our first question of three, 61-year-old um, female who received her second kidney transplant four years ago had a biopsy performed due to an increase. Again, the, uh, the idea here is an elevation in serum creatinine over a, a period of time, and uh, the question is, what, what is the most likely cause? She has a donor-specific antibody that's present. It's HLA uh, subclass 2. So the options that are available, uh, do you start her on something like rituximab, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody? Do you stop the calcineurin inhibitor altogether? Um, do you consider scheduled follow-up visits? So I, I'll answer this question for you just to try to keep on, uh, on time. But uh, the, the concern here, uh, I, I think the most obvious answer would be to, uh, dis, uh, to decrease the uh, CNI um, as compared to discontinue. That's not an option. Um, and what I emphasis here is non-adherence. Uh, we're dealing with this a lot, and uh, it, it's been reported in, in multiple locations, multiple groups, that about 25% of all graft loss is associated with non-adherence. And we don't make it easy, but uh, at the same time, interstitial fibrosis also mentioned inside of the question stem. Um, we think of this as associated with calcineurin inhibitor toxicity, but that is uh, less so the, uh, the emphasis as of late uh, and more so thought to be in an immunologic response, and we'll focus again on uh, the idea of uh, a chronic rejection episode, chronic antibody-mediated rejection as, as to the etiology. So just a single paper here. Um, this is work from uh, Manitoba. You'll see a lot of some of the outcome studies from Canada as well as the United States, and so this one uh, tracks 315 patients, about 50 of which ended up having de novo donor-specific antibodies. Uh, these antibodies that are generated against the graft that are actually found um, on the surface of, of the endothelial cells and other cells inside of the graft. Um, they developed after transplant. 50% of those that ended up having uh, de novo donor specific antibodies ended up losing the graft, and 50% of those patients ended up having non adherence, at least described inside of uh, this group's report, uh, based on um, self admission. So the patient said that they were uh, non adherent. So it's a, it's a big issue. So moving on to definitions, um, pretty straightforward here. We're somewhat mandated uh, by the federal government, Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services, to report on outcomes after one year. Uh, and all centers have to do this, and they're um, uh, uh, evaluated as, as a result of this, and so it permeates the literature, and so pretty uh, recognizable as to why we look at one-year outcomes. Of course, we want the graph to last for 20 years, but at the same time, when you hear the term late allograft loss, they're talking about one year and, and further after transplant. Complications that we'll be talking about during this uh, talk is um, uh, primarily involving the cells inside of the kidney, tubular epithelial cells, uh, capillaries inside of the interstitium, uh, the podocytes inside of the glomerulus. Um, as compared to what you've heard in the last uh, discussion, and that was related with cardiac disease and cancer, uh, kind of surrounding the kidney, but uh, not involving the kidney itself. So the focus here, the kidney. One important study here when it comes to breaking down, um, again, trying to sift out reasons for allograft loss, intrinsic allograft loss, a uh, single center study from the Mayo Clinic in 2009. Um, important to identify that acute rejection really is, is not um, that common, uh, commonly present. So uh, we were talking about uh, the definition of late allograft loss, intrinsic loss, uh, the categories to kind of move us in the direction of cause of late allograft loss. And so we were talking about this single uh, Mayo Clinic Center, uh, Mayo Clinic study. And uh, it simply breaks down a number of biopsies that were done. Uh, the two most common causes, uh, at least inside of this upper Midwest uh, patient population, uh, was recurrent disease and transplant glomerulopathy. Um, this can be con contested. Uh, recurrent disease is something that I'll speak about a little bit uh, later. Not as much of an issue as compared to transplant glomerulopathy in other centers. So again, every study you have to really weigh uh, a number of different things in order to see whether or not it applies to your practice. Uh, and at this point, 
I simply mentioned recurrent disease and transplant glomerulopathy as, as two points that we will cover, um, but they also saw as, as signals here of concern for late allograft loss. So uh, Phil Halloran um, uh, in Alberta, as well as um, a number of other centers, total of five, uh, looked at uh, similar data over um, a 10-year period. And this report's only about three years later, so in 2012 as compared to 2009. And pretty significant differences when it comes to um, causes for, for late allograft loss. Uh, Antibody-mediated rejection is really being identified here um, as uh, the predominant cause as compared to glomerulonephritis, what would be considered recurrent disease, or um, atrophy and fibrosis, or uh, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, a term that I'll clarify in a little bit also. Uh, simply note this um, in, in the sense that likely this is because um, flow cytometric analyses are more frequently being used now as, they're, uh, as compared to a decade ago. And so uh, part of the diagnosis of uh, antibody-mediated rejection is the presence of a donor-specific antibody. And if you're not measuring for those, then you're not going to find them. So this is in part related to the uh, ability to, to make a diagnosis as to what we're actually finding. So prognostics. Um, how can you anticipate a problem and so um, fit the right kidney to the right person and just prevent uh, 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 early uh, graft loss, you know, uh, uh, after that, you know, one or two year period? How can you make it last for 20 years? Well, in counterpoint, uh, there is this report that uh, has come out from the Necker Hospital in France and it relates to the, um, the patients um, that have been followed for um, over, the, over 20 years and have had uh, graft survival of greater than 20 years. And so, Somewhat uh, truisms are just being reported here, and that is in the sense that the, the donors as well as the recipients are both under the age of 30. Well, I, w I wish all of our, uh, our patients could be of, of that type, but they also emphasize that um, these patients were um, uh, CNI-free, so they were on acephyoprine and steroids, and some of these patients just didn't have the option. Cyclosporin wasn't there at the time. Um, However, they, they make a point to the conclusion uh, of their study that uh, it, they think part of the reason for this uh, extended graft life is, uh, is the absence of CNIs, which can also be contested, but recognize that that is a uh, predominant stream of thought that's out there. Other prognostic factors, they're multitude. Um, if you're actually asked um, to, uh, to remember all of these, I just think it's, uh, it's inefficient studying for those that are studying for the boards here. Um, but I would say that each one that's listed here has been associated with uh, early um, uh, or um, a, a shorter graph life as compared to uh, patients that don't have uh, the, the covariate that's mentioned. But I will focus on uh, what's become really common practice for us every time we're looking at organs. And uh, one of our, our colleagues is in the back actually doing donor call right now. And so um, KDPIs are, are being mentioned for every organ that's being offered. It's called the Kidney Donor Profile Index. Um, and essentially, it replaces that term extended criteria donor. It uh, identifies those patients, uh, that is, those donors, um, deceased donors, uh, and their risk profile for actually having uh, graft survival in the recipient um, at one year. Higher the number, the worse the outcome. So if you're a 99, if you get a, a kidney that has a KDPI of 99, 98% uh, of the other uh, patients that received a kidney that year are, gonna, are anticipating better than, than, than you will. Um, at the same time, recognizing inside of this report here that if you matched for all of the uh, variables um, in, in the patients that were analyzed, including diabetes and cardiovascular risk, if you got a KDPI kidney of 98, you did better than that same patient that's on dialysis. So um, recognize that the, the higher the KDPI, there, there is a, a break point here for those that have uh, KDPI of somewhere between 70 and 80, so they do do better. Um, if you end up having a higher KDPI, it is more likely that um, that, that kidney is not going to last as long as, um, as other kidneys. Um, final prognostic here, I simply emphasize histology, because uh, that's what we talk a lot about as, as nephrologists and transplant nephrologists as well. Um, recognize that uh, inside of this study, trying to look for uh, prognostics at three months post-transplant, 
that acute rejection episodes actually did not factor uh, significantly. Whereas uh, G scores and CI scores, these are BAMF criteria, renal pathologists getting together inside of these policy making meetings, uh, the BAMF meetings, uh, identify that G scores, that is irritation, inflammation that's identified inside of glomeruli as well as inside the interstitium actually associate with disease. So they don't have rejection uh, during that first year. They have some sort of inflammation, specifically endothelial-based, and that actually associates with late allograft loss. Somewhat, somewhat interesting there. So another big term, interstitial uh, fibrosis and tubular atrophy, uh, IFTA for short. It's uh, been in our lexicon as a transplant nephrologist for over a decade now. It um, replaces an older term, and uh, the idea is really to be nonspecific. <laughs> if you can believe it, uh, and try not to associate cause. Uh, the term that it, it replaces is chronic allograft nephropathy. Um, and so not only um, is an immunologic response identified here with IFTA, but also other insults, drug toxicity in particular, CNIs. Um, and again, we're dealing with the interstitium. You're looking for collagen deposition there, but you're also talking about uh, the vasculature. So I simply highlight that and said the morphology, not only are you looking for the amount of fibrosis, but you're also looking at the number of capillaries that are inside of the interstitium, uh, the density there, as well as any um, abnormality inside of uh, the small arterioles and, and capillaries that are present there. So calcineurin inhibitor toxicity leading into um, drug that we use all the time, um, or a class that we use all the time. Our second question, 75-year-old with end-stage renal disease due to IgA nephropathy, received a kidney transplant three years ago on uh, mycophenolate mofetil, um, which has been discontinued. He's in clinic today. Urinalysis describes no sediment. He's got trace proteinuria. Plasma tacrolimus level is 9.6 nanograms per ml. Serum creatinine has increased from baseline uh, from 1.2 to 1.7, and it's relatively acute. Uh, in preparation for outpatient biopsy, uh, what should the clinician do? Number of options here, very similar actually to the first uh, question, um, but this time we have the option to actually reduce the tricolomus dose. So um, I think you all have uh, an, an answer in mind, and uh, this is something we do all the time, and that is uh, reduced doses of, uh, of ProGraph. Um, just kind of uh, trying to summarize what this question is uh, driving at. Um, calcineurin inhibitors still are implicated in, in late allograft failure um, all the time, and part of this is because we can measure levels. You know, their prograft level was 20. You know, there, there's going to be some kind of uh, association with with an abnormality that you see in the in in the lab, especially if that matches with a, with a creatinine, even if the two are just true, true and related. Um, recognize their reduction in CNIs uh, and Tacrolimus primarily, but cyclosporin still out there, especially in other solid organ transplants. Um, usually, the uh, the dose is decreased after that first year to uh, first year, uh, maybe two years if the patient is a uh, higher immunologic risk, and then the focus is on a, on a lower drug level, five as compared to ten nanograms per mL, for instance. Um, Irritation seen there inside of the arterioles as it relates with hyalinosis and tubular vacuolization, which I'll show you soon. Um, so again, uh, tacrolimus is still the most commonly used immunosuppressive drug in solid organ transplants. Mechanism of toxicity is, is pretty nailed down. Um, the thought is that there's an increase in endothelial synthesis inside of endothelial cells. Uh, there is a um, uh, progressive vasoconstriction that is um, indolent but is maintained. You have a chronic ischemia, and as a result, um, histologic changes due to that chronic ischemia. And reported here only two years after cyclosporin came into market in 1983 for the treatment of, uh, of kidney transplants. In 1985, these rabbit studies more or less uh, described for you uh, a titration, uh, an increase in cyclosporin from 10 mg to uh, 20 mg per kilogram. Roughly the amount of, of dosing that you would use inside of a 100 kilo person, 100 milligrams BID, for instance, versus 200 milligrams BID. And you see an increase in renal, or a decrease in renal blood flow with uh, titration of the cyclosporin and an increase in vascular resistance. So um, the uh, histologic findings, stripe fibrosis, you'll see that term less and less, I think, uh, just because it is so vague and you can see it in so many other circumstances, in hypoxic circumstances. I would say even in patients that have COPD, 
um, but we see it more uh, acutely inside of or, or more uh, manifest inside of patients that have uh, lung transplants and those that have ventricular septal defects. It's a state of chronic hypoxia. Um, and manifest inside of these uh, scarring regions that look like stripes. Tubular vacuolization, more so an acute toxicity related with uh, tacrolimus or cyclosporin. You can see this vacuolization um, of the tubules. Whereas the arterial hyalinosis, you'll, you'll see, again, this uh, somewhat shearing of the um, small blood vessels and uh, sometimes occlusion as well with hyaline deposits present there. So treatments for CNI toxicity, uh, vasorelaxants and uh, dihydropyridines are, are really the, uh, the focus. Um, th there is some data out there with lecidipine uh, as compared to amlodipine um, actually increasing GFR in, uh, in patients. But um, this is on a population basis. Can you actually associate that with longer al allograph um, life? Uh, it, that's more difficult to do. Uh, when it comes to endothelin antagonists, at least knowing that endothelin um, is being uh, uh, generated in higher amounts uh, in, in these uh, capillaries and arterioles, you would think that uh, ET1 antagonists would be the, uh, the target for this side effect, but uh, bocentane, for instance, is actually contraindicated as a result of uh, untoward hypotension uh, when given in combination with the calcineurin inhibitors. So again, we focus on a decrease in, uh, in immunologic, or a decrease in, in dosing, and sometimes there's conversion to other drugs, um, mTOR uh, inhibitors, uh, rapamycin as well as sirolimus, uh, recognized that CONVERT trial back in 2008 or so um, that uh, put out a warning for rapamycin in patients that have a GFR of less than 40 or um, 24 hour, five, uh, 24 hour uh, protein load of greater than 500 milligrams. Um, those problems being accelerated if you convert someone to, uh, to sirolimus. Everolimus, used more frequently now, the thought to be not as, uh, uh, as noxious as, uh, as rapamycin, but there is a concern for um, overall immunologic risk in those patients that are prone to rejection. Bilatacept, or um, CTLA-4 fusion inhibitor, um, also a, an alternative to um, CNIs, but uh, recognize that EBV negative patients it's, uh, cannot receive this drug for the concern of uh, post-transplant lymph lymphoproliferative disease. We're a little concerned about patients that have MGUS as well, frankly, um, but that's um, not, not a, uh, a concrete contraindication. So uh, recurrent disease, um, Final question as, uh, as a lead in here, 55 year old with ESRD with uh, P. anca vasculitis who received a second deceased donor kidney transplant. You can tell we uh, see a lot of patients that have had multiple kidney transplants here, but um, he had his last kidney uh, six years ago. He presents a clinic with a proteinuria of 1.3 grams, um, urine protein to a urine creatinine ratio uh, by spot check. Um, is 1.3 grams. He maintains a baseline serum creatinine of 1.5. What is the most likely cause of, uh, of his proteinuria? Transplant glomerulopathy, um, diabetes mellitus, uh, no data as we call it, new onset diabetes um, after transplant recurrent disease, CNI toxicity. Acute cellular rejection. Do we have any A's in the room? B's, C's, D's, E's. So transplant glomerulopathy is, is likely the most common um, cause, at least in this stage for the patient. The question is, you know, whether or not um, this is diabetes manifesting. You know, you can compare that to someone, it's, you know, a rough association, someone who's received uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. They're not going to usually have recurrent disease inside of their uh, uh, heart vessels, coronary vessels until, you know, five or 10 years later. The idea here is also you've got a new kidney, Usually the vasculature is pretty good there, um, and you're not gonna have uh, any evidence of uh, diabetic nephropathy inside of that donated kidney. So it's not until you actually have a development of NODAT um, after five, six, seven years um, that you're gonna get a manifestation of proteinuria. So the idea is that uh, the manifestation of proteinuria due to NODAT is probably gonna be after 10 years, where this would be the, the right time for transplant glomerulopathy to, to manifest and, and form protein, or show proteinuria. Um, also recognize that those patients, this patient uh, has a second transplant, so he'd be considered high immunologic risk, um, are going to be prone to having uh, transplant glomerulopathy, and MPGN um, is the most common recurrent disease. Ankyovasculitis, uh, certainly a concern just because often it uh, manifests uh, in the uh, uh, in the patient initially in such profound uh, 
ways that you would expect it to be um, as aggressive post-transplant, but um, I'll show you some data that's actually pretty reassuring. So MPG and the most concerning, FSGS for recurrence, uh, second in line IG nephropathy, uh, I mean, that's the disease I would prefer. Chronic rejection, at least here inside of this very old data set, but it's a good one because it's coming from Australia and New Zealand, and they've got one of the uh, most robust registries, transplant registries that are out there. And so uh, back in 2002, they noted that chronic rejection was the most common cause of late allograft loss when it comes to recurrent disease, uh, really not that bad. Uh, again, those patients that uh, end up surviving five years, they're dying of heart attacks or cancer um, as compared to the recurrent disease. Breaking down that recurrent disease a little bit more, um, MCGN, that's uh, in Australia, that's MPGN. Um, so mesangio, uh, uh capillary uh, GN as compared to membrane proliferative gomerinophritis. And note that, again, uh, the likelihood of graft loss is highest there, but still not that bad. I mean, 87% are surviving for those that are followed. You know, very low numbers at uh, 10 years, but for those that are, are, are followed after, after censoring. Um, FSGS and, uh, and um, membranous glenophritis are kind of neck and neck, and then uh, IgA and posse immune or, or, or ankyovasculitis. As ankyovasculitides are actually um, pretty, uh, they've got uh, great outcomes and, and actually overlap pretty closely when it comes to survival. So ways to anticipate um, FSGS. FSGS is a concern to us um, because of, if we make the diagnosis that it's recurring after transplant, we've got to consider plasmapheresis. Big procedure, we try to avoid it whenever we can. Um, certainly complications associated with uh, such an aggressive procedure as that. So um, still not very good tools to predict who's gonna recur and who's not. There, there's something, there are some um, data points that are out there here Back in 2009, it was reported that if you had a gram load of greater than uh, 10 uh, per 24 hours, that you're more likely to recur as compared to those that um, had a gram load somewhere less than that. So uh, again, we still don't have a, a lot of good markers to identify um, who's going to do poorly and who's going to do well, but recognize that that data is out there. Ankyovasculitis, I mean, it just doesn't happen very much, so we don't have a lot of data out there. But at the same time, for those pooled uh, patients that have been analyzed, I mean, the, mo uh, the greatest concern among these 20 patients back in 1993 uh, was about recurrence in one patient for every 10 years. So um, at least when it comes to looking at, uh, at outcomes, you know, pushing to the five-year and 10-year mark, ankyovasculitis really don't have um, uh, a lot of concern when it comes to recurrence at the level of immunosuppression that is reported during uh, that epoch of time. So again, a lot of calcineurin inhibitors, azathioprine's being used as well. Transplant glomerulopathy, I've, I've mentioned it a few times. Let's um, probe it a little bit more. It is a histologic term. You're gonna find it inside of uh, a lot of the BAMF reports. And, and most simply, it's an expansion and a duplication of the, uh, of the glomerular basement membrane. Um, and you can see it on H and E. And so in centers that don't have electron microscopy available, uh, you can find it. It's, uh, it's really easy to see if it's, if it's apparent. Um, recognize that if a patient has lupus, you have to start thinking whether or not there's recurrent lupus as compared to uh, transplant glomerulopathy. But again, that's a small population that, uh, that you really don't have to deal with uh, very often. These other findings when it comes to endothelial cell damage certainly are present, uh, but at the same time, uh, if you read through some of these BAMF uh, reports, they really try to make it as simple as possible, and that duplication is the, the most important, the expansion of the GBM. Mechanisms. There's plenty of people that'll argue that there's um, manifold mechanisms, but really the focus should be on human leukocyte antigen-derived antibodies. Donor-specific antibodies would be considered a subset of HLA antibodies, um, but at the same time, at least HLA antibodies are thought to be um, really a, a driving force behind the uh, development of TG. So here I simply show you where those endothelial deposits are in electron microscopy. I think this is 10,000 X or so, and you can see here that it's just below the intimal lining, and then again on the right-hand side, the, on the far right of this HNE stain, again, just really uh, marked separation of that, uh, of that GBM. So the sequence here kind of as a schematic as to what happens. So you end up having um, uh, the, uh, the recipient will develop antibodies to the HLA antigens that are on the surface of endothelial cells, primarily inside of the kidney. Uh, there will be a slow development of these antibodies. 
likely because the patient is partially immunosuppressed. Again, we're dealing with patients that uh, you know, skip a, a prograph dose uh, once in a while, they can't get their meds, insurance changes. You know, we're talking about outcomes for 10 years or so, and, and as a result, there's gonna be a, a real difficulty in maintaining that prograph level of five to seven for a decade. And as a result, there's gonna be this ability for the uh, body to respond, generate antibodies, get a deposition of the antibodies uh, on the endothelial cells. The FAB portion of the antibody will bind um, to that HLA marker. Uh, the FC receptor is, end up, is going to end up binding complement. You'll get the complement cascade activated, kind of in low indolent forms. Uh, membrane attack complex is generated as well. Damage to the endothelial cells, you'll actually get a change in uh, the endothelial cell phenotype. Um, adhesion molecules will be expressed more apparently. You'll end up getting this recurrent inflammation. Neutrophils will be present. Lymphocytes will, will focus in these areas as well. And you finally get that histologic manifestation. So um, I mentioned chronic antibody-mediated rejection as our last topic due to the fact that transplant glomerulopathy has to be found um, in histologic uh, sections in order to make the diagnosis of CAMR. And uh, antibody-mediated rejection is uh, chronic. Um, is really what we're focusing on now. Um, I, I would say more than simply describing someone as having transplant glomerulopathy. And this is again focusing uh, more so on mechanism, uh, trying to identify what is the cause of this and eventually treatment. We don't have any treatment for, for TG right now or CAMR, uh, aside from really just trying to uh, be more fastidious about uh, maintaining uh, the current immunosuppressant that the patients are on. But at the same time, CAMR diagnosed when you find transplant glomerulopathy on, on the H and E stain. Serologically, if the patient has donor specific antibodies, uh, the microvascular inflammation can be uh, uh, found in a few different ways. Peritubular capillaritis is probably the most uh, common uh, diagnosis or thing that you'll find on the. Uh, on the histologic sections, but you can also see this based on, uh, and this is inside the Banff report, but nobody uses genotyping um, of, the, uh, um, of the patient's tissue uh, to actually try to identify a, a different array. But think of peritubular capillaritis when you think of microvascular inflammation. C4D deposition, you probably heard this previously, and that's the idea that um, you know, in acute uh, antibody mediated rejection, you have C4D deposition. That is uh, not necessarily the case in CAMR, but you can have it. So it's a plus or minus. If it's present, then you know that, that is concerning, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be present in order to make the diagnosis of CAMR. So the late, great Paul Terasaki um, has reported on uh, HLAs being present inside of uh, patients six months post-transplant and then tracking them out over three to six years and try to identify um, outcomes. And so what he did was take a number of uh, serologic uh, samples and only got processed over at uh, one Lambda, um, his uh, HLA lab in California. And uh, what you see here is patients that have uh, the presence of HLA antibodies um, ultimately did worse. Uh, they had uh, uh, significant amounts of, of graft loss after three years uh, in, in some populations in, uh, in North Carolina, I think was uh, this lowest number. Uh, 200 patients, of, of those 200 patients, 30% uh, of them actually uh, lost their graft after, after four years. And, <clears throat> the separation here is, uh, is really just a trend, meaning to say that if you did not have HLA antibodies at that six-month time point post-transplant, you did better. So, um, you know, you saw at the, uh, at the beginning of this talk, we talked about de novo donor-specific antibodies, again, a subset of HLA-derived uh, uh, antibodies. The, these are concerning. Uh, we are, you know, focusing more and more on the development of, of DSAs and, and what this means uh, when it comes to therapy. Um, it, again, our hands are kind of tied here because we're dealing with such long um, uh, periods of outcome. You don't want to give someone a, a yet another immunosuppressant or a change of therapy um, uh, to make them only uh, that much more immunocompromised over such a long period of time. Acute rejection, really easy to deal with because you're just treating quickly and then you're going back to their, uh, their maintained regimen here. Um, really we're at the phase of making a diagnosis that's more clear trying to identify mechanism, but uh, to be able to actually change therapy, uh, we're, we're still um, not at that point yet. But risk factors, risk factors for CAMR, and not adherence. HLA class two antibodies, recognize that you will see that uh, over and over again, that if the patient has HLA class two antibodies as compared to class one, they're gonna be more likely to have uh, or develop CAMR. <clears throat> 
So just a few summary statements. Uh, try to compile things, because again, we got broken up a little bit. Not adherence, it's out there, it happens a lot, 25% of the time. Likely a patient's late allograft loss is gonna be associated with it. Interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy, IFTA. Very uh, kind of non, uh, uh, nondescript, but at the same time, um, it, it is used inside of the BAMF criteria in order to identify whether or not a patient has uh, significant disease of, of a chronic sort. Calcineurin inhibitor toxicity, still use the drug a lot. Uh, Tacrolimus in particular. Cyclosporin's out there, just, uh, just not, not as frequently as even a decade ago. But realize vasoconstriction is what we're dealing with when it comes to the uh, side effects there, recurrent disease. Uh, really n not, a, not a bad uh, thing to have when it comes to, um, uh, or uh, recurrent disease is not something we really have to deal with a whole lot. Um, transplant glomerulopathy, start thinking antibody media rejection and, and uh, think causal in that way. So a few references here. Um, at this point, I'm glad to answer any questions, but I know that uh, we've got um, things to do and, and people to see, but please tell me.